Welcome to the By Way of Commandment podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the finer points of his doctrine. Join us as we study the gospel through the scriptures and standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Cameron, Josh, um, I, I really appreciate you guys being here and taking the time to chat with me. Um, I kind of wanted to start our discussion just talking about where the idea for the Shattering Triangles project came from and maybe briefly kind of describe what that what that analogy is, what what exactly that metaphor is that uh, is represented in this idea of shattering triangles. Yeah, um, I guess I'll take this one since um, for better or worse, I guess it's something Todd and I, I don't know. Actually, I don't know, Cam, did you? I don't remember exactly how it came to be, except that uh, for probably at least five or six years, Todd and I have used uh, the term triangle just when talking to each other to mean something that we understand, but not perfectly. Um, And so it it comes from this idea and I I can't remember who came up with the, uh, the sort of story uh, probably uh, both of us did. And the idea is if you have somebody who lives in a house and has never left the house, uh, doesn't, doesn't know what that's like. Um, and they ask you to describe for them a mountain. Um, you might try a lot of ways to describe what a mountain is. You might say it's a big pile of rocks. You might go to tectonic plates and how they shift and how they fold together. You might try, um, dirt and none of that is going to help to describe to somebody who's never been outside of the house what a mountain is because they don't know what dirt is. Uh, They don't know what rocks are. They have no idea what a tectonic plate is. And there's just so many things that they have to understand first before they can understand what a mountain is. And the idea was that, you know, if you were doing that, you might say to somebody, look, for your purposes, a mountain is a giant triangle up in the sky. It's all you need to know. It's a giant triangle up in the sky. The problem is, of course, that if that person who has been in the house their whole life finally leaves the house and they actually see a real mountain, there's a tendency for them to say, well, that's not a mountain. And you're like, well, how do you know? Well, it's not a mountain because it's not really up in the sky. It's actually touching the earth. And uh, it's not even that triangular shaped. I mean, a triangle has to have uh, certain angles or it doesn't count. Um, and there's all of this weird stuff with color on it. It just doesn't make any sense. It's not a triangle. Um, so the idea is that a triangle is a belief that is true as far as it goes and true for us now, um, but needs to be amended if we're going to make progress. Uh, you know, if you walk around thinking that a, a mountain is a giant triangle up in the sky, you have really missed so many things about what a mountain is. Uh, that would be really helpful to you. And so the idea behind shattering triangles is to think about these things that we think we know in the gospel, but we don't actually know. Uh, We only know just a very little about them. And that as we sort of develop a more, another way to think of this as a higher resolution understanding or a higher resolution picture of what they are, then in fact, the things we thought we knew, we don't know. And, um, and sort of the theme is, um, is actually uh, in, in first Nephi, well, second Nephi and first Nephi at various places. But um, the, the theme is that uh, God gives us as much as we will accept. And when we say we have no more need, like, you know, the, the, the famous scripture, a Bible, a Bible, we have a Bible, we have no more need for a Bible or he says, wherefore murmur ye, because ye shall receive more of my word. Um, so that's the idea behind Shattering Triangles. The idea is don't stop learning more. Don't think you know things. Don't put them on a shelf and say, okay, I know that. I don't need to ever reconsider that. And we're trying to help people sort of reconsider things that maybe they thought they knew, but but they didn't uh, know as well as they as they thought. Uh, in the idea of bringing us all closer to truth. That was a very long way of saying what I needed to say, but there you go. Well, I, I loved it. Um, 
I've used this analogy a few times before in talking with uh, family and friends. Um, and the, the biggest, um, one of the biggest takeaways from me in the time that I've been on YouTube is putting out videos and trying to share some thoughts and, and share my testimony of things. One of the biggest takeaways for me is there is a large percentage of people I interact with predominantly online, but certainly um, within church circles and, and uh, whatnot who are kind of in this um, position of we're in the church, we're active, we're doing the thing, right? (laughs) We're, we have a testimony of the gospel, the book of Mormon, et cetera. And they feel stagnant. They feel like they've kind of reached this plateau in their spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't really know what to do to get out of that. And they certainly don't want to go backwards. They, they recognize the need for the gospel of Christ in their life. Mm-hmm. So it, they want to press forward, but figuring out how to do that is, has become difficult. Um, and I know I felt, that quite a bit at times where I feel almost kind of stuck. And so this idea of shattering triangles, um, as you guys put it, and the name of your, your podcast, your channel is the shattering triangles project is this idea of helping people maybe reconsider or look at gospel principles, doctrines, themes, etc., uh, in a slightly different light that might help people get over this hurdle and continue on their faith journey towards Christ. Is that, would that be an accurate uh, description? Yeah, you bet. I love that. Um, There's some thoughts about that related to the term unbelief that are probably worthwhile. I I don't know, Cam, if you want to talk about sort of unbelief and what that might mean Uh, or Jacob, maybe you you have something else you want us to get onto. So I don't want to force that, but that, no, no, go for it. I, I do have a topic I'd love to talk about, but I also kind of want to, um, I, I don't want to shoehorn a topic in when I think that there's something important that needs to be said in a different direction. Okay. No, so Cameron, yeah, Cameron, if you want to help us understand this idea of unbelief and where that, where this plays into the, this discussion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm not going to lie. I had thoughts as you were talking and then, and then Josh oh, teed me up for something. No, no worries. I lost my train of thought. Yeah, go back to the, go back to the thoughts that you had then Cam. Well, I, I, I lost them. So Josh, maybe you should keep going on unbelief and maybe it will come back. Okay. To I'll talk about unbelief. Uh, so look, um, the thing that keeps us always from more information, more knowledge is us. Uh, We say this all the time on the podcast, uh, and I think it's probably the most important thing we say, which is God is not resisting you. Um, God is not trying to keep you from receiving everything that you are capable of receiving. There's nothing that he has available that he doesn't want to give you. Um, It's just that you can't actually handle all of the things. You're not prepared to receive them. So it's, it's work that you have to do. And, and, and one of those things is this idea of unbelief. Unbelief, uh, I think we think it means a lack of faith, and I suppose it does, but it often means a belief in something that isn't true, that keeps you from believing in something that is. So uh, an easy uh, answer or an easy example of this is what you just said, um, which is if you think you know the answers to all gospel questions that are relevant, And you'll hear this sometimes uh, in in church. If you go to the LDS church, you'll hear people say things like, well, that's not pertinent to our salvation or that's not important or whatever. If you think that you actually know everything you need to know, then you literally can't make any progress. It, It will damn you. And not because God doesn't want to give you more, but because you just won't listen. It doesn't really actually matter what he says to you if you aren't listening. And so... Um, you, you, that, that feeling of being stuck and being stagnated and being unable to make more progress, a lot of times that is things that we're holding on to that are not true, that are keeping us from accepting something that we need to know that's our next sort of step that will actually draw us closer to our Heavenly Father. 
we, we can't take that step because we're holding on to something that isn't accurate. And, and as long as we hold on to that, we won't be able to accept and learn the thing that is. And, and, and so in that way, unbelief is a little bit different than, um, uh, than, than you might think. It's actually broader than just not believing stuff. It's actually embraces believing things that are either not true or are, as we just talked about, triangles. Things that are true at a certain level, but if you want to go to the next level in your understanding, you have to get rid of those things and go to a better or deeper understanding uh, of, of truth. Um, you know, it's it's interesting how we all kind of approach this from different angles. I'd say between the three of us, between me and Todd and Josh, we all have, I think, kind of, um, we all, of course, I would say we, we understand the analogy, but the thing that I think maybe we, we focus on or have value in, I, I don't know, it's just unique hearing Todd talk about it and Josh talk about it the way that I think about it. Um, cause I think another, another angle on this is helping people retain faith in Christ as they're moving through this process. Because sometimes what is the case is, you know, God confirms to you X is true or, you know, this is a, right. He tells you, this is a triangle, a triangle's mountain. And then through whatever circumstance you come to uh, believe or feel or, uh, you know, what you're learning seems to indicate something different and you're trying to like pick up the pieces and figure out how to reconcile it. So, you know, there's this, there's this process that we sort of have to be in the flow of. And if we hold on too tightly to what we have, like Josh is saying, that can damn us. And I think it can even, if we hold on too tightly and we're resisting truth, uh, it, it, we can come around to this point where, you know, there's, there's contradicting information to what we think we believe that becomes so overwhelming that it, it completely shatters uh, any sense for what we thought we knew. And if you're not willing to, I think, be flexible and follow the spirit through that and let the spirit rework your understanding, um, it's easy to lose faith. So an analogy that I like to use sometimes is uh, the early apostles with their conception of who Jesus was and what it meant to be the Messiah. Um, because they, they knew, right? Peter knew by revelation that Jesus was the Christ. But he also had, I think, some tradition and maybe assumption that he brought with that as to what that meant. And so then when Christ is taken and he's arrested and crucified, then they none of them really know how to put the pieces together or figure out what's going on. And uh, and eventually the spirit um, does help them to, to turn the triangle into something that's a little bit higher resolution and, and more true. But... Um, yeah, so I think that being said, the idea is primarily we want to build faith in Christ in the search for truth. So that as we're like, as, as anybody is pushing through this, they will learn to trust him no matter what they encounter and let him teach them. Yeah, um, maybe this is going to drive a little bit more towards kind of the main topic of today. Um, but I use this analogy in another quorum discussion that we had some months ago um, where I used uh, Lehi's dream of the tree of life. Um, and we went through Lehi's dream in elders quorum. And I asked him to kind of paint the picture, what what's happening uh, in the dream and who are the different groups of people that are being represented uh, throughout this dream. And one of the groups of people that I pointed out were those who, uh, and, and this is not directly explicated in the, the t in the text, but I can imagine that there were people who had grabbed hold of the rod of iron and clung to it tightly and were too afraid to move forward towards the tree because the mists of darkness around them and, and whatnot, they were too afraid to move forward, but they clung to what they had. Um, and my, I don't remember exactly how I phrased it, but as we went through this, uh, vision together as an elders quorum, I said that person holding on to what they think they know out of uh, whatever reason, maybe it's fear uh, of stepping forward, that exercise of faith, right? Because moving forward is an exercise of faith. Um, knowing that there is 
a further journey to go on and you're clinging to, to what you have and staying put will damn you every bit as much as wandering off into strange paths. Um, you're still not getting to the tree if you're not willing to take that step of faith and move forward. And so the, the, the idea of the, the word of God is what's being represented in the stream as the rod of iron. It doesn't just mean uh, the written scriptures as we have them. It doesn't just mean uh, talks by presidents of the church and whatnot, but in a very real sense, it, it means the actual word of God, what God has revealed to his children on earth collectively as a, a covenant body of people and individually. Um, there are going to be things in your life that are going to be hard to get through. And if you cling to what you know, and you're not willing to move forward and take that leap of faith and reach out to receive more of the word of God and press forward on that journey, you're still not making it back to the tree. Um, and there's something, there's something to be said there. Um, and I, my worry is too many of us at some point in our life get stuck clinging to the rod of iron and, and for whatever reason, can't take that next step forward. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. You know, um, I, I was talking with someone recently who made a great point, which I may have thought of a long time ago, but I haven't, I haven't considered this in a while, which is, you know, we have this tendency to claim that we have all truth. Um, and very frequently what happens is when someone who is in the rhythm of going to church, uh, usually this is someone that's going to be 18, 19, 20, uh, goes to the temple for the first time, that the difference is almost so night and day from what they're used to as far as worship and religion and, and all of that goes, uh, that they leave going, was that the same religion? Is that the same thing? Like, I don't see how that connects. And, you know, I think we ought to approach um, the fullness of the gospel and the fullness of God's truth with the same sort of humility and openness that we would uh, from being someone who was an unendowed member of the church to, to later being endowed, if that makes sense. That it's something that can be so outside of what our conception might be, even though it is animated by the same spirit, um, that we shouldn't we shouldn't hold on too tightly to what we think we know and should rather be, I think, pretty open to the possibility that um, the mysteries of heaven are perhaps far different than we are. Yeah, I would, I would add, uh, I think there's a real tendency to feel, and, and I think, I think our, our reason why we like to hang on so tightly to those things actually there's a couple of them, but one of the big reasons why we like to hang on so tightly to things like that is actually because we feel like it is our job to root out and keep pure, um, root out false doctrine and keep the church church pure in some way. Um, there's some interesting, I have, I have a bunch of thoughts on that, but without going into too much detail, the short answer is, to the extent that's important, it's it's far from the most important thing. And um, there's a really good case to be made, and I've made it, that what distinguishes Joseph Smith is that he doesn't have this fear of new information. Um, his, his initial reaction when confronted with new information is to believe it. And not just to believe it, but to immediately act on it in ways that you know, at least to my eyes as a, as a, you know, older guy now, almost 50 years old, who uh, has lived a while in the world compared to Joseph, um, seems crazy. I can't believe how fast he would act on things that he had received. Um, and, and, and the idea is, if you don't believe in what God tells you, then you're stuck. God can't work with you. But if you will believe what he says, and then you wind up believing something that is not true, then the theory is that then he can correct you and teach you what is true. 
Um, whereas if you refuse to believe, if you want to draw lines around what is acceptable and what is not, um, at least too tightly, then then there's then then you're going to run into a, a, a the kind of problems that we've just been talking about, where you you cling to your whatever it is that that your your triangles are. Yeah, and it it's it brings back, us back full circle to the verse kind of we started with, where you know a Bible, a Bible, we have a Bible, and and it's sufficient. We don't need any more. Um, okay. So on, on this topic, I want to get into uh, recognizing temple themes in the Book of Mormon. Um, some discussions I've had more recently with um, various people have been that of recognizing our own temple worship in the Book of Mormon. And if that's even, uh, if we can even make the case that uh, the temple and its themes and its principles and doctrines are even recognizable in the book of Mormon, if they're even taught. Um, because I think to Cameron's point, a lot of people will go through the temple and feel that it's so night and day different than our, our worship. Um, you know, certainly than our Sunday worship and, um, and the, the things that are more typical in our, uh, throughout our lives that it's hard to recognize where these things come from, uh, in their, their most basic foundational sense. And, um, and even those who have been going through the temple their whole life, their whole adult life, and um, kind of feel in this position where it's like, well, I've, I've been going to the temple for years and years, and I kind of know how it goes. I know all the right words and, and phrases. I know, um, I know all the signs and tokens. So that, you know, the actual presentation of the endowment is a piece of cake. Cause I know everything. Um, what what is it that we can do to help break ourselves loose from from that kind of idea and recognize some deeper meaning and themes uh, that the temple is trying to teach us and how we can learn them from the Book of Mormon? Mm, what can we do? Yeah, what we what can we do? It. I think I think. Um, it's been a big, big focus of mine in this last year has been talking about the temple a lot more in my own videos and trying to, uh, trying to talk about the temple in its most foundational, uh, principles and, and doctrines. And, um, hopefully, uh, as, as we've done that, there will be some more, um, light and knowledge come through. Um, but that, that's certainly the goal of mine. Um, and I know that, uh, from watching your videos, cause I, I watch your channel quite regularly and I appreciate the work that you guys are doing and the presentations you put together and the discussions and the come follow me has been fantastic. I, I get the sense that this is a big, uh, concern of yours as well is helping people get over the hurdle of thinking we know everything. Um, and, and you know, I just need to wait it out until I die and then I can go to Celestial Kingdom. Um, and I, I really, I really, really don't like the idea of in of mischaracterizing the principle of enduring to the end as simply just holding on to what we have and just waiting till we die. Um, I, I, I feel personally that that's a mischaracterization of what the scriptures are trying to teach us. Hmm. You know, I, I think a lot of it, uh, a lot of it ties back to that principle too. Um, there's a verse in Jacob six. I really like here. Let me see if I can pull it up. So this is Jacob six eleven. Oh, then my beloved brethren, repent ye and enter in at the straight gate and continue in the way, which is narrow until ye shall obtain eternal life. And so there's the formula. Mm -hmm. Or you, if you will. Um, it's Lehi's dream, right? You enter in the gate, you continue in the way until you come to the tree of life. Uh, Christ says, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life. And so there's a there's a beginning, there's a path, and there's ultimately a destination. And, and another way that you can think about the word end, and as a matter of fact, the phrase endure to the end, 
uh, where it shows up in Matthew 24. The word end uh, comes from the Greek telos or telios, which essentially denotes something more like a purpose, right? The, the principal aim or the goal, um, you know, to this end, I was born, that sort of idea. And so the idea of enduring to the end is endure to the purpose uh, of this of this whole project. Um, endure to uh, endure to the tree, right? Endure to becoming one with Christ, to being filled with His love, mm -hmm. um, and ultimately of life. And the idea of life is <clears throat> injury that takes us back to the presence of God. So I think I see this as the exact same path that the endowment is laying out where we are traversing through the celestial, through the terrestrial and ultimately to the celestial. And there's this upward path of receiving greater light and truth until we can come to a fullness. And I think at its core, once you can see there's just one journey that we're all being called to take, you can see um, elements of that journey show up everywhere by different names uh, spoken of kind of from different angles in the Book of Mormon, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the temple, um, and in many other places. Yeah, I think um, the, the, the best way to sort of appreciate the temple is, uh, is probably to work there. Uh, I realize not everybody can do that. Um, I've been a temple worker for a little while now, and um, it, it. I went in as a temple worker, having been a, a pretty faithful temple attender my whole life, uh, with a pretty good, I thought, understanding of the things in the temple. Um, but going and working there has has given me a whole different appreciation for so many small little things that connect up to other, you know, sort of bigger things. It, 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 in the, the Book of Mormon, to, to, to Cam's point, the reason it makes sense as a temple text is, is, is only after you've spent enough time with it, and, and I think also with the Old Testament, I know Cam in particular spends a lot of time with Isaiah, um, but I think if you spend enough time with the Book of Mormon and the Old Testament, then the temple starts to make more sense. You start to see really, really, really crucial patterns um, that you just you just can't see until you've um, until you've been exposed to them enough times. And I, I can't emphasize enough how much of a difference it makes to just simply spend time in the scriptures. Um, I, I make it through these days. I'm lucky a little bit, but I, I make it through the standard works once a year. Um, and I, I, I found that the best thing for me was to let go of the desire to always find something interesting every single day in the scriptures. But just understand that if I am reading through, you know, Daniel or Jeremiah or Isaiah or, or any number of other uh, bits, uh, Chronicles is a particularly uh, difficult one uh, to get a lot out of sometimes, um, that I'm going to be back. I'm going to be back next year. Um, and what I need to know, I just have faith that the Lord will sort of lead me to that. And I've been really uh, blessed by that um, that experience. So I guess when I what I would say is, if you immerse yourself in the scriptures and you you go to the temple not thinking of it in terms of Of, um, of, a, of a box that you're checking, if that makes sense. But instead, go looking to be taught. You'll be surprised at the things you can learn in the temple. And then you'll be equally surprised at the places where you see temple things outside of the temple. Uh, some of the most obvious ones that are pretty straightforward, um, there, there doesn't seem to be a version of the temple in which the, the, the tree of life does not play a really significant role, just visually, which is actually kind of interesting. Um, why is that? 
uh, even when they barely mention the tree of life in the actual ceremony, the, the, the tree of life plays this remarkable role and it has resonances throughout the scriptures. Um, I think the ideas of the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, that, that whole idea and how it is tied to um, to what the adversary is saying he's going to do, what the Lord is saying he's going to do, uh, what happens around the same time, how Adam and Eve got their garment, what the garment means. All of those things are really, really scriptural. Um, and I have to say probably one of the funniest not intentionally, but funniest things that I encounter is when I read critics who make comments like, oh, well, it's just the the, the temple ordinances are simply Masonic. And I, I just think that's just so funny. I mean, that's just, it's sort of like a bunch of, uh, you know, not to be insulting here, but it's, it's like a, it's like a bunch of second graders saying, ah, oh, this calculus stuff is stupid. It doesn't make any sense. Who needs it? You know, like you guys don't, you guys haven't even, you, you're so far from being in a position to understand, much less criticize the thing that you're talking about, that I just, your opinion is worthless. Um, I really think that's, that's sort of the process of getting yourself to a place where the temple works for you is, um, is just really being taught from on high. Uh, and, and it's a, it can be a slow process, but it's it's super valuable i don't know if if that makes uh, sense or maybe i went on a little long yeah i i had a, a thought as you were as you were speaking just now um i think in in some sense um we both both uh faithful latter-day saints who regularly attend the temple and those who are maybe critical of the temple and, and may see it as simply a ripoff of Masonic um, uh, Masonic ritual. Uh, I, I think there's a, I, I think on the one hand they're, they're missing the forest of the trees um, by focusing on the wrong elements mm. um, or focusing on the elements in a particularly incorrect way. And then on the faithful side, we can tend to almost turn this, the temple into an idol by focusing on the specific signs and tokens and um, and some of these things that are meant to be, in my understanding, uh, tools, for lack of a better word, to communicate with us. They're, they're symbols to communicate with us eternal truths and principles that we are to live out in our actual life. Um, I, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, yeah, you know, this is the whole idea of shattering triangles in some sense, is that God speaks to us in our own language, and he starts with what we have and will imbue his spirit into it in a way that is comprehensible to us. But that as we almost move through the words he gives us like a gate um, or like a QR code, you might say, we can see that there's something greater behind it. And we sort of chase that. So we go through the triangle, I think, to kind of come to the mountain. Um, temple endowment is the exact same way. There are physical symbols we're being given in a way that that is understandable to us. Um that are supposed to point to a spiritual condition or reality that um, is something that we are coming up to and experiencing. So in a lot of ways, I think it's like a roadmap. Yeah. I, um, I've described the temple endowment um, and I include the initiatory uh, rituals in this, but I've, I've described it as the prophetic ascension theophany in scripture in ritual form where we're being taken through this presentation or ritual in which we are reenacting um, the same ascension theophany that we read in scripture. The, the prophet who's taken to the high mountain and shown the end from the beginning and, and endowed with power from God to go back to their stewardship and help others on that same path back to the father. This is what 
in my opinion, the temple is pointing us towards. It's that that's just in ritual form. It's it's in a way that, like you said, has kind of been broken down into key elements that are uh, are, are are places within a roadmap, so to speak. They're um, those anchor points on the roadmap. Yeah, you know, boy, there's a lot to talk about here. Let me uh, ordinances in the physical sense, you know, physically accomplishing things in this life have to be done in this life. Uh, there's a reason why we perform uh, endowments on behalf of those who have deceased. The reason I bring this up is because I get asked a lot, and I, I suspect a lot of everybody here probably gets asked from time to time, do you have to, must you come into the presence of God in this life in order to inherit the celestial kingdom? Um, well, the answer is a little bit complicated, but but on, on some level, it's actually quite simple. The complicated answer is that all things that are to be done in this life have to be done in this life in order to receive them. But the longer answer is that many things are done spiritually on one side of the veil and physically on the other. That's very, very normal. We all understand that when we are baptized on behalf of someone, we um, we are doing the physical piece of that ordinance that has to be done, and they are doing whatever spiritual piece of the ordinance has to be done on the other side, or maybe they've already done it. The, the same thing applies to the endowment. It is. It really is. You know, so 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 now I guess I would change the answer that I might give somebody that I might have given somebody five, 10 years ago. Uh, the answer is yes, you have to come into the presence of the Lord in this life. The endowment is for most people how they will do that. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't strive to make the endowment real in your life. But for most people, the endowment is the way that you will come into the presence of the Lord in this life. It's a ritual coming into his presence, and then the remainder of it can be and probably will be completed at some future time. Um, and so it's no small thing, actually. It's and and it of all things in our faith probably is the thing that is most tied to all ancient traditions in every culture. Um, you know, if you're looking for a really interesting but very long read uh, about archetypes and stories, there's a book out there. Uh, I, I've read it a few times now. It's called The Seven Basic Plots. And it's about how um, literature is based on a few stories. Uh, one where, uh, and, and we can go through what they all are, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. All I'll say is they all end in the same way. They all end with a hero who was a normal person, who goes through trials, overcomes those trials, and at the end is welcomed as typically with another half, either a male half if they're a female or a female half if they're a male, is welcomed either back to a kingdom that they originally left, think about the Odyssey, for example, or is welcomed as the new king or new queen of a new kingdom together with their other half, which they have been united with. So they overcome a monster or they go on a quest. Um, they achieve these things. And during that process, they overcome various evil obstacles. Uh, and they do that by demonstrating their own virtue. And then they enter into this kingship or queenship sort of uh, ritual. And if you want to know more about this, um, there's a really great video on our page uh, called Becoming Kings and Queens that has something to say about this that's actually super detailed and much better than anything any justice I could do to it. Um, but this is the endowment. Um, and this is the journey we're all trying to take. And so if you're watching for those things as you read the scriptures, all of a sudden they will jump out and bite you. You'll be like, oh, oh, okay. Um, but if you don't know what to look for, it's easy to sort of uh, cruise into the temple and uh, and come out and and see no particular uh, 
no 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 particular thing that is unique or valuable there that you needed to learn uh it's just one thing you had to check in terms of boxes i don't know cam it's your video if you have any thoughts on that oh on becoming kings and queens yeah or or, or other things no i i think you put it perfectly um i would add to what you were commenting on earlier in regards to the value ordinances you know one thing I actually picked up from Todd several years ago, I really liked the way that he put this, was we are participating in Babylon's ordinances and rites and rituals all the time without realizing it. We're immersed in that culture. And, you know, the way you can think about an ordinance more than like a religious rite is um, it's a pattern. It's anything that really has been ordained by something. Um, so, you know, we have all sorts of rituals and patterns and whatnot that's just a part of culture that we are engaged in from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep and what the ordinances of the gospel are intended to do are to initiate us and transition us into the order or the culture of heaven which is something that um is perpendicular you might say to the way that we're used to doing life so we go through these ordinances and it's almost like it's a way of tuning us um, to the frequency on which God vibrates or, or heaven vibrates or however you want to put that. Um, I, I, there's a lot to say there. Um, I want to go back, just uh, take a step back to ordinances and what ordinances actually are, and you mentioned their their patterns, um, in in ritual form, their uh, symbols, so to speak. the The signs and tokens of an ordinance have it, have some inherent meaning uh, in and of themselves, but together they point to a much larger principle or law. Um, without going into detail about specific signs and tokens. Um, within the temple, there are signs and tokens that make that together make an ordinance that is given and received. And I think sometimes uh, we, without looking into what the symbolism is and what the the meaning is of these signs and tokens, it can it can the the fuller meaning of how they help us understand the larger principle or law that we are covenanting to obey um it, it escapes us and becomes more difficult i think for us to recognize um and so to that point uh that josh mentioned a few minutes ago um you can get through the whole temple endowment and feel like you you know everything um and then that's just kind of it you you did the thing um so now what um so I don't know if you have any more to say about um, ordinances as patterns or um, patterns in general. Yeah, you know, I, I actually do have some thoughts. This is this is something I've been meaning to talk about at some point, and maybe I'll put together a video on it. But uh, you know, I think we would we would be best served by adjusting the way that we think about symbolism, because I think in our culture we kind of have a tendency to equate symbolism with metaphor, as in uh, you know, sometimes something is just like a static, if we get like a parable or an allegory or what have you, it's like, okay, they're talking about something, they're just using like code words, and we just have to like, decode what they're talking about to get the secret message. And that's kind of like the idea of a metaphor or something. And, and symbolism actually is much broader than that. Um, the best way to think about a symbol is uh, like a word, y you have Kind of abstract meaning that is combined with uh, sounds or, or letters or whatnot that don't necessarily mean anything. And it's like when those two things come together and you have a word, a word is a symbol. Um, an ordinance is a symbol. An ordinance is a word. I don't know if, if that makes sense, but the idea is symbolism is something that happens actually all the time naturally. The world we live in is symbolic. Everything 
is symbolic because everything is sort of following these flows. I'm oh, sorry. Everything is sort of following these, these flows and patterns. Um, so, you know, to give you an example, for a long time, it was the case that, uh, you know, this is in the, in the dark ages, churches would be the center of cities or civilizations, and they'd be the highest point to which people would look. And then with time, as, as we kind of became wealthier, we started, um, you know, building buildings and, and people would make buildings that were taller than the churches. And it's like, I mean, look, you can do that. And practically it's, um, yeah, at least immediately, it's not going to change anything. But the, the point to which everyone in that city is orienting is no longer going to be the church, right? Like it's no longer going to be the religious center. Things kind of start to get distorted. And so there's kind of this, inherent symbolism in everything that we do you know if we're if we're building buildings that are taller than um the religious holy center what does that what does that indicate it's like we're putting uh institutional corporation worldly learning that sort of thing above or or it's higher than you might say it's it's closer to heaven this is the the problem with the tower of babel right um then the things that ought to be sort of orienting us that way so it's the idea is like we are we are participating in symbolism all the time and the temple is trying to show us the patterns that we ought to be participating in in our in our lives all of the time it's it's like a rhythm that we get into and once we get the rhythm down we can do it in small moments and we can do it in uh, larger moments across you know on like this on the scale of our entire lives um i, I don't know josh you have any thoughts there um, I think, yeah, I, I think what you see in the temple is all of life distilled down to about three or four episodes. And, and by the way, really successful if you're paying attention to what's being, being, being taught you, um, we don't even need to spend any time in the garden. There's a whole bunch of things you can learn there, but just think about the things that we experience in the world. And we wander looking for truth and for knowledge. We ask for it. Somebody comes to answer our prayer, but that person who first comes to answer our prayer doesn't have the truth. It's, it's a counterfeit. And we have to sort of ignore that for a minute. Um, and if we don't, we wind up, um, and we, we know what we wind up worshiping. We wind up worshiping money and things of this world. Uh, if we reject that invitation successfully, then messengers can come and teach us. If we don't reject that invitation successfully, we go nowhere. Uh, we don't we don't see that hypothetical, but we know that when messengers are sent to visit us, they're sent to visit us uh, in disguise. We don't know who they are, uh, and they just want to see what's important to us, what we value. Uh, and 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 really, as I've argued uh, in a couple of places, they they want to see whether we've already joined the great and abominable church. Um. And there's an incredible one-to-one -one correspondence between what they're testing you on and, and the great abominable church. Uh, and if we haven't, then we're eligible to receive more light and knowledge. But if we have, we, we don't see this in the temple, but if we have uh, joined the great and abominable church, presumably they just go away and they'll come back another time to try again. Um, but we may never, we never, may never recognize them. We may never get to the next level. So, uh, and each time they come, they bring us a new endowment. It's not a single endowment, but it's a, it's a, it's a series of uh, clothings that represent actual power to do real actual things that are brought to us by messengers from the other side. Um, and as we continue to keep the covenants, then we keep moving forward. This pattern, this is the basic pattern, and we can talk about um lots of details about it but it's pretty incredible to take all of the varieties of human life that can exist 
and boil it down and say, okay, in these three episodes, this is really all you kind of need to know. Just think about, just think about the incredible way in which the temple distills what you need in your life to three or four things. It's 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 remarkable. Yeah. Um man, I wish we had hours and hours to to keep discussing because there's a number of avenues I think we could go. Um to your point, the the Book of Mormon, so the first Nephi is I think probably my favorite book in the Book of Mormon because it lays out this endowment pattern not once but multiple times. Um, and even when, when Nephi is carried up to the, the high mountain, um, he's asked, do you believe the things that your father spoke about? He's being checked on the, the, the spirit or the angel comes to check on him. Um, you've, you've believed up to this point. Are you willing to go further? Are you in a position where I can give you further light and truth? Um, and Nephi, in his example, uh, agrees in the affirmative and, and continues on that path uh, to learning more. And it doesn't just happen that one time. It happens multiple times throughout his life uh, where he is uh, given further light and truth to help him on his journey. And, and if I might, I could just add something, which is Nephi doesn't get the further light and knowledge by saying he wants it. He gets the further light and knowledge by living in accordance with and believing the light and knowledge he's already gotten. Uh, that's actually what you get tested on in the temple, if you remember. Uh, ha, to, to, to be really careful about how I say it, have you been doing the things that you have already been asked to do in accordance with what you learned elsewhere? That's 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 when you know you're ready for more. And Nephi is doing, to your point, exactly that. That's what he's asked. Do you believe what you've been given so far? And yeah. then he's ready. But not just because he wants to be. You, you, you don't declare yourself ready, is my point. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really important point. Because oftentimes I might, you know, feel like I'm ready. I want more. Um, and if it doesn't come then there's a um, there's an opportunity for me to either look introspectively and go to my father in heaven and ask what do i lack yet what am what am i not doing that i ought to be doing or or if there's something i'm doing that i must uh, change so that i can be put in a position of humility so to speak where i can carry out those things uh, that that need to be done to eventually lead me to receiving greater light and truth. But I can't just say, you know, I want more. Um, and, and, and some, sometimes I think that's the, the dangerous thinking, well, I'm already doing all the things. Uh, so I should be, I ought to be getting more than what I feel I've been given. Well said. That's really you know, well said. To sort of bring this full circle to where we started with shattering triangles, um, another another line from Joseph Smith that we'll quote all the time is uh, the one in which he says, "God has not revealed anything to Joseph, but what he will make known to the least saint, um, or to you know to the to every to the apostles and to the least saint, as soon as he is prepared to receive it, right, or as soon as he's able to bear it, and that really is the." the controlling what's the word I'm looking for element, um, you know, detail, like that's the, that is the, that is the thing that will determine how much the Lord gives us at any given time, because he wants to give us as much as we can bear. And so to your point, Jacob, what we have to do, I think is continually humble ourselves, show that we are willing to be obedient and that greater light is something that's going to be a blessing to us and not, a curse because that I think that's ultimately the reason that God isn't bestowing um, what we've received is either because we'll reject it or because it will actually do us harm. Yeah. If we're given more than what we can reasonably handle, 
um, then because we've been given more, we're under obligation to to live in accordance with that light and knowledge. And if we can't handle that, if we can't do that, then God would essentially be damning us in a sense uh, to your point. Um, so it's important that we live out the light and truth that we've received before we can be prepared and have a place in our heart ready to receive more. Um, and, and to use that example, going back to Nephi, um, it wasn't just him praying because, you know, uh, first Nephi, um, he explains to us, uh, the things that are happening. And he explains that he went up and, and he found some place of, of solitude and he prayed and, and asked the Lord for more, for more knowledge, for more light and truth. Uh, he, he wanted more. It's only because in the prior chapters, he's already, uh, he's already told us that he's carried out the responsibilities, uh, in his example that, for example, that the going back to retrieve the plates, he was obedient to the light and truth given to him by his father, Lehi, to go back to Jerusalem to retrieve the plates. They, they struggled mightily to, mm-hmm. to achieve that goal, to the sacrificing of all of their property and their uh, gold and silver and whatever else, to all their worldly possessions um, to carry that task out. And in doing so, he had fulfilled the pattern, right? He turned the keys and fulfilled the pattern of obedience and sacrifice that allowed him to make the, the, the call to the Lord to receive further understanding and light and truth. Um, if he hadn't done that, uh, if he had failed on, on all fronts to carry out the task that was given to him, uh, you and I reading uh, about him w- would reasonably come to the conclusion that he hasn't earned it. He hasn't earned the right to call on the Lord to receive more. Um, And I think that would be made apparent in a re in reading that text, if it read that way, but it doesn't, we have the example of him faithfully carrying out those tasks. Um, And so we can see that example for ourselves, but in our own lives, it's hard to be that introspective. I think sometimes, Um, and we do fall into that danger of thinking that I should have more than I have. You know, know, can I just go ahead I would just say one thing, which is I don't, I, I know, I know what everybody's trying to get across when they say it, but I, I just like the idea of us having to earn a right to ask for blessings. I sort of feel like it's, it's better to think of it, even though it is the same concept, it's better to think of it as it's not that we have to earn a right to ask the Lord for a blessing. It's that he, he just can't give it to us. It's sort of like your little kid comes to you who's two years old and asks for a Ferrari. It, it, it would be meaningless to give you a Ferrari. It just, you can't do it. Um, and it's not, you could phrase that as, well, he hasn't earned the right to get a Ferrari if you want to. But I, I don't like it because I, I, I'm nervous about the idea about getting in our heads this idea that God is somehow waiting for us to uh, prove our worthiness to him rather than waiting anxious. It, it's really about, what it implies about God's attitude towards us. I sort of feel like it's important for us to feel like he wants to give us everything. And we're the ones in the way rather than that. He is waiting until we reach a certain level to want to give it to us. I I don't know if that really makes sense. And and I'm probably splitting hairs there, but I just, I just like, it's a little bit of a hobby horse of mine. So, you know, (laughs) take it for what it's worth, I guess. Um, Yeah. You know, go ahead, Cameron. I was going to say, you know, to piggyback on that, and maybe Josh would be more okay with the word qualify or something like that. No, I don't like that word either. Phil, uh, no? (laughs) No. Well. You're enough, Cam. You're already enough. Josh and I have, Josh and I have arguments about semantics all the time. So I, I think, so I was recently listening to a BYU devotional. I think it was by um, S. Michael Wilcox from, oh, geez, probably 15 years ago or longer. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's he was talking about uh, prayer. And he gave this example of um, from his own life. And I'll have to include the link to that uh, that talk so others can go back and listen to it. But he gave this example in his own life about having grown up without his father, his father left when he was quite young. And so uh, brother Wilcox and his siblings were basically raised by their single mother who was uh, a 
uh, in all accounts, a wonderful woman, active and faithful to the Lord and raised them to be God fearing children. And, um, he always had this kind of, um, th- this dark spot, so to speak in, in his, uh, or a chip on the shoulder. Maybe I don't know what the right phrase would be, but he had this chip on his shoulder, so to speak, regarding his father who had left the family. And he w- always kind of grew up a little bit sour and bitter, uh, when it comes to um, anything to do with his relationship with his father, which he didn't have until he was an adult. Um, and he, he talks in, in this talk, he talks about how he had prayed throughout his life as a child, as a teenager on his mission throughout his life about um, how, how to have, how to forgive his father. Um, he didn't want to be angry about it anymore. Um, and this went on for years and years and it wasn't until he was an adult married with children, um, that he finally received the answer to his prayer in a very profound and meaningful way for him. Um, and I don't want to speak for him or, or, or misquote him. Uh, so I won't go into exactly what he said, but the idea that he shared was, I had to experience enough of life and go through enough um, experiences for there to be a place carved out in my heart big enough to hold the answer that God was always willing to give, but I just wasn't in a place yet to receive it. Um, And that's the way that he put it. Um, And I've thought about that quite a bit since I listened to that some years ago. Um, and maybe I don't know how to how to congeal that down into a single term or phrase, but I think Josh is right. The the terms earn and qualify, I think, imply something about the relationship that God wants to have with us that is incorrect. Um, and I don't quite know what the right term yet is to use for that, but it this is the example that came to my mind. And maybe we can at some point figure out a better term to to use for I like that. the idea of receive. I think that's really good. I think there are just some things you can't accept um, from. You, you just don't have the capability of of accepting and using whatever it is, and therefore you don't get it. But not because it's not fine for you, and not because there's a desire not to give it to you, and and the mind has to be changed. But in fact, because. Um, God wants you to, God can't give it to you. Just, it's just something you can't, you can't have um, because you're not capable or, or ready to have it. It, it, it. You're right. To some extent it could be semantics, but I think I like it because I, I get nervous about, um, well, if you read the lectures on faith, you find out that the most important thing you can do, um, I argue for most of us, is to be willing or to understand the um, character perfections and attributes of God and anything that you believe about him that is gets in the way of that will make it very difficult for you to exercise faith in him. Yeah. Well said. Um, I was going to add, you know, to what you said, Jacob, I think the way that we go about, um, and I won't use qualify because I might trigger Josh, Mm -hmm. but uh, I think the way that that we go about preparing our hearts to receive, you know, meeting the conditions whereby we are are prepared to and capable of receiving what God wants to give us um, is through a process of, it's actually ironically doing exactly what Josh is talking about, which is I think getting away from the the mindset that we are somehow and i got to be really careful in the way that i go about wording this um that we are somehow trying to prove something but on the other hand um what god wants from us we read in ether 12 the reason that he gives us weakness is so that we'll be humble right and when we get to a place where we can acknowledge our own nothingness and our own weakness 
and can say, I am nothing without you, Lord. I'm totally 100% dependent on you. And any fruit that I am capable of bearing will only be because I'm grafted into you and you are flowing through me and I am getting out of your way. That's the that's sort of the condition and the place that we have to come to in order to be able to merit anything because we can't merit anything of ourselves. Um, to, I, I had the interesting picture in my head um, as we've been talking about this and, and you used the phrase earlier, Josh, um, uh, what is it? Resisting the Lord. Um, mm -hmm. I used, I, I, I conjured up in my mind this idea of a uh, football player, like posing like the Heisman trophy mm -hmm. uh, where he's got the football and there's somebody trying to tackle him or grab the football from him. And he's like Heismaning like away from him, like get out of here. Um, if the football is represented as like the blessing or, the answer to a prayer or the knowledge that we seek and we're trying to wrestle it out of his hands and he's resisting us. Um, we've already, um, we've already come up with a, an incorrect, um, idea of what, what the Lord is, is trying to do. And yeah, what we're all seeking for is approval validation the idea that we're okay um, there's a couple ways to get it um, one of them is to go out in the world and get it through money or power or you know sexual stuff or, or whatever uh, the other way to get it is to sort of have god stamp us as approved and unfortunately i think that's what a lot of us are doing when we ask for higher blessings when we ask for visions or revelations or the ability to do miracles we ask for those things because we think that if they happen that's a stamp of approval on us that we're okay from god what we have to do instead though is to understand that we are already okay we have already been declared to be of infinite worth in our sins. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to repent. He does. But the repentance that he wants from us is not motivated by our desire to be stamped okay, not even by him. What he wants from us in terms of repentance is a repentance that's motivated by a deep sense of gratitude to him for his unconditional love and his infinite price that was paid for us while we were yet sinners. We love him, as John puts it in 1 John 4, 19, because he first loved us. That's what we're supposed to be doing here. Um, to the extent that we're still out there playing this game of trying to find a way to feel good about ourselves or feel validated, we are playing the wrong game and and i really feel strongly about this um, this is probably the thing that keeps us from returning to our father is that we're trying to do it as an achievement uh, it, it, rather than as an acceptance and a belief in what he's done and then to respond in love and gratitude Hey, I think that um, this idea has stuck with me for a long time and it's helped me kind of understand some of the, the feelings I've had throughout my life. Um, this idea of being a stranger and a foreigner in a foreign land. Um, this What you're talking about, this idea of trying to seek acceptance uh, to seek approval. And we do that through a number of different, particularly worldly means to try and feel that we're important, feel that we're special, uh, or that we belong, uh, whatever that, whatever it is that we seek and whichever means we use to seek that. Um, in a sense, we feel like foreigners on this earth. We feel like 
there there's some sort of disconnect where we don't entirely feel that we belong and are accepted here and we're doing these things to fill that void um and the recognition i i've had uh mm-hmm. came from uh this phrase in scripture of being a uh a foreigner or being a what is it uh Stranger a stranger in a foreign land. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, if we can, if we can recognize that that's, <laughs> that's just the way it is. This is, this is a foreign land to us. This is a telestial world. This is not our home. This is not, uh, this is not where our home is. If we think of uh, the, you know, the kind of cliched phrase, you know, home is where the heart is if our hearts are really um, longing for our father in heaven to be in his presence and his embrace uh, to be surrounded by his love, then as long as we continue to try and uh, fill this void in our life of being accepted and, and all that with other things, then we'll never truly feel at home. Um. And I don't know if that's a, I'll have to, I'll have to think on this a little bit more, but that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. That's well put. I think it's, I think it's exactly right. Um, when, when, when Jesus says, come unto me, ye that heavy, ye that are heavy laden, or ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yeah. That's the rest he's giving you. It's the rest from the need to feel like you have to validate yourself all the time. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like maybe we should end here because I think that's a really good place to, um, to maybe pause for today. Um, I, I hope for those listening, um, I hope maybe some of the things we've discussed may, um, may ring true and, and, and maybe bring some, um, some clarity to, to things that maybe you might be going through or just in some sense, help you, um, in your own study and, and, um, and what I, what I hope to accomplish with any discussion that we have on this channel, uh, or any video I do is, is to bring some sort of, um, opportunity for somebody else to um, to feel the spirit or to um, come away with something that they can ponder and chew on and uh, take to the Lord and um, provide that opportunity to do so um, that they might not otherwise have done. Um, and I think Josh, um, what you and Cameron have done has brought a lot of, of different ideas to the table today that I, I, think this will be a really important episode for a lot of people. Um, So I want to thank you guys for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's great.